here is a little bit to talk about um, much larger organisms than what we're looking at, and sexually reproducing organisms. Um, also, my background is in animal behavior, and, and I'm really interested in um, how behavior and evolution interact with each other. Um, not just how individual behaviors evolve, but how behavior at an individual level can affect evolution at the population level. And in a sexually reproducing organism like birds, uh, one of the most important behaviors in my mind is mate choice. Um, the mate that you choose to reproduce with has a big impact on the genetic makeup of the next generation. And the way that animals uh, choose mates is by gathering information about them, which is the definition of communication, the transfer of information from one individual to another individual. Having said all that, and knowing that I'm talking about birds, you're probably wondering why on earth am I talking about odor? When we think about bird communication, we don't think about chemical communication in order. We think about their songs, right? These elaborate songs that give information about the animal that's singing them, about their plumage, their vocal uh, feathers, their elaborate plumage ornaments. Uh, and it's no wonder with these very obvious characteristics that we can see here that people have thought that birds rely on these so heavily that they have lost the ability to communicate with odor which is, in fact, not true. In fact, if you look up olfaction in Wikipedia right now, you'll see the sentence. The importance and sensitivity of smell varies among different organisms. Most mammals have a good sense of smell, whereas most birds do not. You'll also notice there's no citation on that sentence. <laughs> now, this belief goes back pretty far, uh, with very little scientific grounding. Uh, but if you look at the uh, anatomical basis of olfaction in mammals compared to birds, it's kind of obvious why we think birds don't use odor very much. Uh, many mammals have a lot of um, anatomical features that are evolved to improve their sense of smell. So for example, if you look at a cross-section of nasal passages in most mammals, you'll see that there's this, this uh, figure described it as a catacomb. There's these very complex structures, and over those structures are stretched the olfactory epithelium, which is this lining in which uh, olfactory receptors are embedded, and that's where we detect odors. These receptors then transmit information back to the olfactory bulb, uh, which is here in the front of the brain. And in mammals, uh, it varies in how large this olfactory bulb is, but it tends to be pretty large in, in proportion to the rest of the brain in many mammals, especially in dogs, for example. Most mammals also have a secondary or accessory olfactory system, including the barber and nasal organ, which is an additional organ that picks up uh, other chemical cues, including things we think of as pheromones heavier protein-based uh, chemicals. And birds, uh, birds completely lack that secondary olfactory system. They don't have bomber nasal organ at all. Uh, but they do smell. They do have a nose. They have uh, nasal passages, which if you look at them, uh, are very similar in that they have these structures which increase the surface area available to the olfactory epithelium. And they do have an olfactory epithelium with olfactory receptors that transmit information to the olfactory bulb. Uh, it tends to be smaller relative to brain size. In fact, in many of the songbirds, we can't even really see it with the naked eye because it's so tiny. Well, you can see it, but there's not much to do with it. But it is functional, and there are functional olfactory receptors. Uh, in a recent surveys of uh, bird genomes, in fact, there have been a focus on olfactory receptors. And it turns out that many of the bird species have just as many functioning olfactory receptors as uh, some mammals do. And in fact, they seem to have evolved new families of olfactory receptors, suggesting that olfaction is alive and well in birds. They might just be doing it a little bit differently than we do. We're not sure. And behavioral data show that birds use scent in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, the first bird on the left is uh, an albatross, which uses its sense of smell to find food while foraging over open waters. The sense of dimethyl sulfate alerts it to the fact that there are dead fish in the water. Our middle picture there is a blue tit, and they use um, aromatic herbs to disinfect their nests and protect them from, um, from parasites in the nest. And these herbs have, a, have scent to them, and they use their sense of smell to know when those herbs are, are used up and need to be replaced because they've been dried out. And finally, several species of birds have shown the ability to detect when predators have been near their nest, just on the basis of smell. In my area of interest, we've also begun to see evidence that birds use odor in, in social signaling. This is a picture of two crested hawklets. They are a, an Arctic seabird, 
And one of the first studies of chemical signaling in birds was done in this species by uh, Jimmy Hagel. Preston Aquas produce very strong tangerine-like odor in the breeding season. And when two birds meet, they perform this behavior here, which is called a rough sniff. They are sticking their beaks in each other's necks, so it's basically to get a good smell of what the other individual smells like. Interestingly, this is where the tangerine odor is strongest. And so Julie was able to show that this uh, odor and detecting this odor seems to play an important role in social behavior in this species. Now, most bird studies today we've been focusing on one particular sense of scent in birds, and that is cream oil, secreted by the uropygial gland, also called the cream gland, which you can see here right above the base of the tail. That's just a little gland here. And when birds are preening, they will rub their bills against this gland so that it secretes oil. And then when they preen their feathers, they'll preen that oil into the feathers. It helps protect them from exposure to the environment, from sunlight. It can help waterproof some species. Uh, it also even helps protect them against parasites and chewing, you know, feather chewing lice on the body. And we now know that this is also a source of volatile compounds that give individual birds their odor. So my overall question for the past few years has been understanding how birds use odor to communicate. My study system is the dark eyed junko. Um, I don't know if anybody saw the uh, junko film yesterday. Was anybody here for that? Yes. Uh, so that was my colleague Jonathan Atwell. Uh, is the producer of that film and uh, focused on this particular species. We used to be in the same line. Um, but I've studied um, several subspecies of dark eyed junkos. These guys are spread throughout North America and they diverge in the last 10,000 years into a number of subspecies that we recognize just on the basis of the plumage. They breed at high altitudes, so in the mountain ranges on the east and west coast, and also at high latitudes, you can see the slate color jungle has a large breeding area up in Canada. Um, I've worked with four different subspecies. The slate colored junco at the bottom of their range in the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. The pink sided junco in uh, Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. The white winged junco in the Black Hills of South Dakota. And the Oregon junco again at the southernmost area of the range in San Diego County. Now, I've, I opened this talk by showing you a lot of very, very colorful, very beautiful birds. And juncos are not known for their colorful plumage or extravagant plumage ornaments. Um, but they do have one particular plumage ornament that's been of interest to many scientists because females find it attractive and there's variation at an individual level. And that's the amount of white in the outer tail feathers. Uh, we call this tail white for obvious reasons. And individuals do vary. Males tend to have more than females. And within males, there's, you know, there's a positive correlation between age, testosterone levels, and body size such that older, larger males with higher levels of testosterone circulating in their system tend to have more tail white. So this seems to be an honest signal of, of how of, of the male's individual quality. And females do prefer males with more tail white. So that will be um, a, a, a visual trait that will contrast to what we can learn about how they use odor to communicate. So odor has become very interesting to me uh, because uh, our studies have shown that these signals provide a lot of information <coughs> to the birds, and these are the kind of information that's really important to make choice. If you find a mate, first you have to find someone who's an appropriate mate, that has to be the same species, opposite sex, and ready to breed. And they also have to be of good quality, so to, to, to improve the quality of your own offspring. And so we can divide these into two different um, needs here, mate recognition and mate assessment. So just to start off, we know that information about species identity is present in these signals. Uh, here we have on the left two songbirds, so it's a gray catbird on the top and a northern cardinal on the bottom. And then on the right there are two seabirds that are closely related, blue petrels on the top and Antarctic prions on the bottom. And with each photograph are these um, gas chromatography and mass spectrometry chromatographs. Uh, these are basically data coming from a uh, machine we use to determine what volatile compounds are present. You don't need to understand much about this right now. I will tell you that basically what it does is it separates out these compounds on the basis of their size, so that the smaller compounds come up first and the larger compounds come up last. And then we can identify what compounds are there. But just by glancing at this, you can see that there's different patterns associated with different species. And these correlate to different species-specific sets of volatile compounds. So different species will differ qualitatively. The, the, the overall set of compounds you have 
gives information about what species you are. Now within species, we also have uh, variation. In jungos, both males and females have the exact same set of compounds, but they differ in how much of each compound they have. So here's just an illustrative example. Um, sizes are up here. Uh, they should be the same size circles. But basically it's showing uh, four compounds that we know differ by sex, and the relative proportion of each of those compounds and the overall makeup of those odors. So you can see the blue compounds are found in higher proportions in males, and the pink compounds are found in higher proportions in females. I have a little asterisk here because there are some species in which there are species-specific compounds. Junkos aren't one of them, so we just see quantitative differences. So there's just different measurements of the same compounds. You can think of it as like perfumes. Right? Some notes are many perfumes have the same floral tones to them, but they might have one being more um, more obvious than others in, in, in higher numbers. These chemical signals also give information about a bird's current condition. Uh, importantly, it gives information about seasonality. Like most North American songbirds, jungos are seasonal breeders. So in the summertime, they will form ex socially exclusive pairs, uh, one male and one female, defending a territory together, raising offspring together. But then in the wintertime, they go down the mountain or come down from the, the Arctic cold to a more um, nicer climate, and they live in large blocks. So these are very different social behaviors. And we see a relationship between the odors they produce and which, which um, condition that they're in. So here this graph is just, um, these are a set of linear alcohols that we see in jungles. These are concentrations, mean concentrations for males. The orange bars are males in breeding condition. These tiny little gray bars next to them are males in winter condition. So you can see that they produce way more of these compounds in the summertime than they do in the wintertime. This is our first clue that these odors might actually be important in reproductive behavior. So next we wanted to look at this, the, this change more closely. And this is at our field site in Virginia, um, slate colored jungos. And we go down there in April, the beginning of the breeding season, and we start catching birds then. And this is a time of big change in the population. Birds are they're, they're coming back from their winter migration grounds, and they're undergoing a lot of hormonal changes and a lot of behavioral changes. They start to lose mates in the territories and court each other. And so this seemed like a really good time to look at the changes in the odors. Now in males, which are not shown here, we saw a really nice steady increase week by week. This is over four weeks, the first month of the breeding season. And that made a lot of sense to us. We see a very different pattern in the females here, which is confusing to me at first. Um, you can see week one to week two, there's no change, and there's this huge change in week three, followed by a little bit of a decrease. And so I said, well, what was happening in the population in week three then? What was going on? And one of the things we found was uh, when birds were laying their eggs. So the date that a female lays her first egg of a clutch, we call that her egg one day, and because they tend to lay one every day, so they're done making a clutch. And if you look at week three, you can see there's a population peak in laying their first egg. The white line is all of the females we studied in the population, and the orange line is the females that we sampled for the odor study. And you can see the same pattern is there. Uh, so what this says to us is that these odors could be um, giving information about a female's readiness to make. I'm ovulating right now, that's my egg. Now's a really good time to fertilize it. Right? So this can help um, synchronize breeding behavior between the males and the females. Okay, so all of that was uh, for identifying a proper mate, right? Uh, next, we wanted to understand if you could get information about individual quality based on these odors. And there's a lot of ways to measure quality. And there's been a lot of different ways people have measured it. But ultimately, what it comes down to is your reproductive success in the next generation. Are you able to produce offspring that survive? And so we just used that as our measure. We tested whether the odors at the beginning of the breeding season predicted that individual's reproductive success in that season. Could a female smelling a male in April decide, yeah, he's pretty high quality, I'm going to have babies with him? <laughs> and it turns out um, that they can. So here we have, um, this is a principal component score on the x-axis. Basically, what this is, is if you have a data set with a lot of different variables, in order to reduce that down to something you can analyze, you run principal components analysis, which takes all the things that are internally correlated and turns it into a smaller number of, of um, variables. So this is just one of those four variables I have out of that analysis, and I'll explain what's in it in a little while. 
So you can just think of this as a score. And then on the uh, y-axis is the number of genetic offspring produced by that bird. Here in blue are the males that I studied. And you can see that we have a strong, significant, positive correlation between this particular score of their odor and the number of surviving genetic offspring they produced in that season. We also looked at females, and we found another correlation in the opposite direction. So we see that females have a negative correlation between this score and the numbers of surviving offspring that they produce in that season. So that's interesting, but what does it mean, right? What compounds are contributing to this score? Well, I looked at that, and it turns out there are primarily three uh, bisomethyl ketones that we know from previous studies are strongly associated with sex differences. So what we see is that the males typically have much higher proportions of these compounds than females do. And again, remember, males and females have the same compounds, they just differ in the proportions. So one way to think of this is a spectrum from smelling more female-like on the negative end to smelling more male-like on the positive end. So what we're seeing is that females who smell more female-like have more reproductive success, and males who smell more male-like have more reproductive success. Males who smell like more like females, you can see they have zero surviving offspring, and females who smell more like, more like males don't do as well. So that was pretty exciting. And then I wanted to compare it to plumage. Remember I talked about tail lights, attractive to females. It seems to be a, an honest indicator of quality because of the things that it's correlated with. Are females able to judge a male's quality based on their visual characteristics based on this, um, this tail white. Here on the left is the same graph I just showed you, just the males. And on the right is, again, the number of genetic offspring on the y-axis, and a measurement of how much tail white they have using the same birds on the x-axis. You can see that this, there's no significant correlation here. So if females are going to judge a male based on his ability to produce surviving offspring, she's much better off looking at, or not looking at, smelling him, than she is looking at his, uh, his, his visual characteristics. So this seems to be a much more reliable cue. Another thing I wanted to look at, so you may have noticed I've been saying genetics, genetic offspring. Juncos are not genetically monogamous, right? They're socially monogamous, they form pairs, but much like humans, they cheat on each other. And about 30% of all the offspring that we have done maternity tests on in every population we've studied so far is sired by a different male than the one that is raising them. Okay, so there's a lot of males out there who are raising other guys' babies in their nests. And so I wanted to see if odor could also give us some potential information about that. And here we have, uh, this is a different principal component. I'll tell you a little bit more about it in a moment. And on the y-axis is the number of extra pair offspring in that male's nest. We have the number of babies he's raising that are not his own. And here we have a uh, significant positive correlation. What's in this score? This is another set of compounds. These are carboxylic acids, again, that we know from other studies are related to sex differences, but in the opposite direction of the ones I showed you a minute ago. These are found in higher amounts in females. So we've got another spectrum here going from male-like to female-like, and what we're seeing is that males who smell more like females are more likely to be raising somebody else's offspring, whereas the males who smell the most male-like on the spectrum have the fewest number of extra pair offspring in their nests. So again, the more female-like males are more likely to lose paternity to other males. So it seems like females are able to get a lot of potential information about their mates based on their odor. They could be judging, okay, who do I want to set up house with, who do I want to have raise my children, by that second score I just showed you. might be telling you something about their parenting ability. It might be related to different levels of hormones that are related to raising offspring. We don't know the answer to that yet. And they're also judging potential genetic mates. Does this guy smell like he's going to have surviving, lots of surviving offspring? Should he be fathering my offspring? So they could judge their social mates on that and also potential extra pair mates they might want to do with. So this is a really, this was a very exciting finding, and um, there's a lot more questions that come up from this. And one of the questions that we've had is how are these, what's producing these compounds? How are they related to the bird's individual biology, their actual genotype or their phenotype? And I actually gave away a little bit up here by choosing which question to put up. Um, we know from studies of uh, many mammal species that the scent marks, that, the scent marks that they make, their scent glands, are actually populated by symbiotic bacteria that are responsible for producing the odors that they use when scent marking. 
And so I teamed up with Kevin Tice, a postdoc at Michigan State, who studies set, set production in hyenas to test whether this is true in birds as well. If you look at the green gland, uh, it's got a lot in common with mammalian scent glands. Uh, this tip here is the, uh, the part that you see above the, uh, above the skin, it's that little tip at the top. The rest is below the skin. It's actually quite a large gland. Um, and much like mammalian scent glands, it's dark, it's damp, it's you know, a great place for bacteria to grow. And it produces this oil. It's waxy, but a lot of bacteria can survive in oil and, and wax. And so it can seem like a good place to start looking for bacteria. So we know from one other species that there is evidence for the symbiotic bacteria in the Greenland. This is a European hoopo, and in the breeding season, the females normally white, um, over the green secretions, change to this dark and actually quite foul smelling substance that she uses to coat the eggs. And a number of studies found that uh, what's happening is that there are different bacteria colonizing Greenland when she's in. Um, when she's in breeding condition, and they're producing antimicrobial substances that are very helpful to the, to the breeding bird. It helps protect her, her nestlings from, from harmful microbes. So we know there's bacteria that can be there. The question now is, is this useful in chemical communication? Because um, most of these compounds that we've studied so far are known products of mic microbial metabolism. So to get at this, we sampled uh, bacterial communities from nesting juncos in their offspring. Uh, this was again conducted at a field site in Virginia. And so we, we sampled uh, both parents and all nestlings from 13 different nests. They typically have four, four, two to four eggs in a nest. I mean, in our sort of study, was three. And we sequenced the DNA that was present in that to find out what bacteria are present. So we used a um, microbiome way of doing this where you target the RNA gene of bacteria and you sequence all of the ones present and then you can narrow them down by matching them to a known database to find out what species of bacteria are present. Uh, to do this, um, you get a lot of data, just like Zach was talking about, and you have to narrow that down a bit. You generate what we call operational taxonomic units, or OTUs. Basically, everything that's 97% similar or more is lumped together into a single sequence. And that is sort of a rough approximation of a species, although well, that's debatable. But these are units that we can use to analyze how much diversity is present and start to identify what species are present. So the first thing that struck us was that junker bacterial communities are incredibly diverse. We found hundreds of OTUs, but the top 20 OTUs, the most common ones, only accounted for about 45% of all the sequences. And no single OTU accounted for more than 6% of any individual sequences. Now, this doesn't mean much to you now until I show you the comparable data for hyenas. In, in hyena scent glands, the top 20 OTUs present accounted for over 90% of all the sequences in the data set. And the, the most common OTU accounted for 45% of all the sequences. So we were initially quite struck by this, wondering if we had contaminated our samples, why are we finding so much diversity here? And then, then it hit me. Hyena scent glands have one job. They're there to produce paste that hyenas use to separate and communicate with each other on the basis of smell. Green glands do a lot of work. Not only are they using them for chemical communication, but this is actually their main wet method of protecting their feathers, of protecting them from parasites, protecting them from sunlight, protecting them from water. It helps insulate the birds. So we might expect to see a lot of bacteria. They're doing a lot of different jobs. They might have antibacterial bacteria or antifungal things. So, we, it makes sense that we're seeing a lot of diversity here. This is a cladogram showing the most common OTUs in our sample. You can see a lot of them are unclassified. Um, we've identified these all at the phylum level and many at the genus level, uh, but the ones that are unclassified, we don't know what they are yet beyond phylum level. Uh, these are a mix of, oh, oh, these are found in um, over 50% of our samples, and the ones with asterisks are found in over 75% of our samples. So these are the most common ones. This is a mixture of anaerobic and aerobic bacteria. Again, in contrast to mammalian scent glands, which are primarily home to only anaerobic bacteria. Again, this probably has something to do with the way we're studying this. Um, when, when Kevin was sampling hyena scent glands, it's actually a scent pouch that he would turn inside out, scrape the face out, and would look at that. We were looking more at cream oil on the bodies so on the surface of the cream gland. 
others. So you might, they, they are exposed to oxygen, so we, we shouldn't be surprised to see an anaerobic and anaerobic bacteria. And as uh, expected, several of these um, genus genera do have documented antibacterial or antifungal properties, so they may be performing those services for their host. It's reassuring to see that most of these are known symbionts of animals and plants, um, animals in blue, plants in green, but surprisingly, lots of these are more frequently documented in soil. Didn't expect that. Again, thought about it for a minute and remembered that juncos are ground nesters. They don't build their nests up in trees, they build them on the ground. Typically, they really like hillsides and underneath um, foliage that helps hide them from predators. They spend a lot of time on the ground. And if anybody here has bird feeders in the winter, if you've ever had juncos come to your bird feeder, you know that they don't get up on your bird feeder. They eat the seed on the ground. They're ground feeders as well. So they're spending a lot of time in contact with soil, so it may not be surprising that they're picking up microbes uh, that somehow over time became adapted to the junco environment. So the next question, is okay. Are these are these um, bacteria that we found? Are they producing the volatile compounds that Jungo seem to be using to communicate? So this is a list of the seasonally varying uh, volatile compounds that we've been studying, and we see quite a few of them. And we searched the database called the Microbial Volatile Organic Compounds Database, which uh, has compiled from the literature all of the compounds that bacteria have been shown to emit. And we put in every genus we had, and we found that two in particular, Burkholderia and Pseudomonas, actually emit over half of all the volatile compounds that we find in Junko Prenol. And these are just the ones that have been measured so far, so there could be more. Uh, it could also be that they're helping break down larger things into these smaller things. I don't know. Uh, so the orange ones are the compounds that uh, are found in these two genera. And then the numbers here are the number of species in that genus that produce this compound. So for example, 21 different species of Burkholderia produce two on um, So these are very strong candidates to do further research on understanding that these two bacteria are important in junko chemical communication. Next, we wanted to look at individual variation of these microbial communities, and we compared individuals with each other. First, we compared the adults. Um, we might have expected to see a sex difference here. We know the two sexes smell differently, um, but we see no, no effect of sex on how these work. So again, this is, um, this is based on the Gray Curtis Similarity Index, uh, just a measurement of how similar two communities are. And when they cluster to, next to each other, they are similar to each other. These are color-coded by what nest they came from. So these are mated pairs in the same color. And so the mated pairs are more similar to each other than they are to other adults. Again, this makes sense. They're spending time touching each other. How do we spread bacteria among each other? We touch each other. In one study of captive zebra finches, uh, they applied bacteria to the feathers of one zebra finch. And then 24 hours later, <coughs> Uh, sampled the cloaca of the permate, and they had fully infect, transfected their, um, their permate with the same bacteria. So it doesn't take long to share bacteria. <coughs> Next, we wanted to understand how these microbes are transmitted across generations. So these are not genetically passed on, these are passed on outside the body. We could have some really interesting implications for understanding how phenotypes are passed on. So just a quick reminder about junko breeding biology. Again, they're seasonal breeders. <coughs> they breed in the summertime, and they are socially but not genetically monogamous. Again, up to 30% of all of their offspring are sired by an extra parent male. Um, also, though, both parents provide parental care. Only the female sits on the nest to incubate the eggs and brood the nestling. She's the only one who has that constant contact with the nestlings. But males do help feed the nestlings, so they're also coming into contact with them. And this here is actually a great picture of Ella now, Oregon Junko feeding his juvenile right there. So we, we did the same analysis for the nestlings, and again we found that they clustered my nest ID against sex. <laughs> So 
individuals from the same nest, like this one right here, all these four red ones all in the same nest, and they're incredibly similar to each other. There's two green ones, two pink ones, that's all. So then we can move into like, their parents. Now there's a lot of data here. I'm just gonna come over here and walk you through it. Um, again, this is the Gray Curtis Similarity Index on the y-axis. The higher you score, the more similar the two groups are. On the top, we have parents compared to offspring. The topmost row is mother offspring pairs. Oh, okay. Topmost row is mother offspring pairs. And below this are two different father offspring pairs. Um, regardless of what these are, you can see that the mother offspring pairs are significantly more similar than the father offspring pairs are. Here we've divided up father offspring pairs into two types, one in which the social father is also the genetic father. So we have genetic similarity and time spent in contact. And here we have unrelated social fathers. So he's not the genetic father, but he is spending time feeding that nestling and being, being around it. Um, there is no difference whatsoever in the similarity between these father offspring pairs. So the genetic relatedness of the father has no effect on how similar the bacterial communities are. We did a similar analysis with siblings in the nest. Um, again, we had some nests that were all full siblings, so there, the father desired all four of those nestlings, all two or three. And we also had mixed paternity nests, so that there were half siblings in them and different fathers. And again, no significant difference between the average level of similarity of those nestlings. So what we're seeing here is that genetic relatedness does not drive similarity in this trait. Instead, it's actually social behavior. The people, the people, the individuals that these birds spend time with are who they're sharing bacteria with. And this is an important phenotypic characteristic. This is something that, again, could be driving chemical communication, but it's not inherited genetically. There's a lot of studies in humans about uh, how we share bacteria. One of my favorites, for possibly obvious reasons, uh, is uh, roller derby. This is a full contact sport, right? These women are pushing up against each other, hitting each other. Um, so they sampled the microbiome, the skin microbiome of the upper arm of roller derby teams. At the beginning of the game, members of the same team were more similar to each other than they were to the other team. But over the course of one game, which was the last 60 minutes, um, they became similar, they converged. So because they were pushing up against each other, hitting each other, um, they were sharing microbes. They became quite similar. So all it takes is physical contact. And this is me here, the referee. This is what I do in my spare time. <laughs> so what we're seeing is that family members have similar pre-gland microbiomes, <laughs> and we're hypothesizing that these bacteria are producing them the odors that they're communicating with, which gives us a mechanism for how they might be recognizing kin through odor. But again, it's important to remember that these might not be their genetic relatives. This is who they grew up with, right? It might not be their actual father, but they share microbes with them, and they recognize him as as kin because they share this microbes. So we've opened up all these wonderful new questions about avian evolution. So for example, we'd like to know how these bacteria co-evolved from, from with birds. Are they picking them up from the, from the ground, you know, initially, and then they evolved co evolved with birds to live in, in their green glands? At what point in their evolution did they co-opt these bacterial products as chemical signals? How are these communities relating to individual bird genotypes or phenotypes or their current condition. There's a lot of mechanisms for this. One thing, one possibility might be that their MHC genes, which are involved in their immune system, actually determine what bacteria your body considers good or bad. You might be rejecting certain bacteria. So that could actually be one mechanism that controls what communities they can be close to. Um, condition can play a role too. We know that there are bacteria on the human body, for example, in the human armpit, that feed directly on testosterone. This is why boys smell worse than girls, because the, the bacteria are feeding on the testosterone and producing odors. So the, there's another clear mechanism for how hormonal condition can be related to odor and bacterial community. And then my area of interest really is, is well, how much of bird nature is actually influenced by not the bird, but the bacteria that they're carrying. How much of evolution, future evolution, is being uh, impacted by these symbiotic bacteria? And one really exciting uh, field set of them to go back to, again, if you saw the jump over you have heard about this incredible place already, 
Uh, these are the Oregon juncos in San Diego County, California. And this is a, a map of the <coughs> that area. And this big section here is the Laguna Mountain Range. This is the ancestral normal jungle habitat. It's high altitude, it's cool, it's nice. And then down here is this little, little splotch. That is the University of California at San Diego campus. This is part of the normal winter range, because you know, it's much nicer than the mountains in the middle of winter. Uh, but it's not part of their ancestral breeding range. Beginning around 1980, I'm sorry, 1981, um, a, good, a small number of breeding pairs stopped migrating. They decided to move in and stay there year-round. And they've become a, a decent-sized population. And in just 30 years, they've adapted to this new habitat. They've changed physiologically, they've changed behaviorally. And there's a number of changes, and they all seem to be mediated by testosterone. Um, these are all things that can be changed by circulating testosterone. There seems to be a change higher upstream in how much testosterone is secreted by the animal's bodies. Now, we, we did look at odor in these birds. And here we have, um, again, this is the principal components again, clusters. And the orange circles are females. The blue triangles are males. You can see there's a significant sex difference. Within the sexes, we've got the open shapes are birds from the ancestral Laguna Mountain Range, and the filled-in shapes are birds from the UCSD campus. But we have a significant differentiation there um, between these two populations. Again, this is just 30 years of evolution, and they already smell different from each other. My new question is, is this driven by microbes? Are they picking out new microbes in their new environment, and that's what's affecting the way they smell, and possibly affecting their mate choice, and affecting their behaviors that evolve as a result. Lots of fascinating questions. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I want to take a quick moment to thank all of my collaborators. I can't do any of this on my own, uh, especially Milo Shabati and Helena Salini, the chemists who've done all the chemistry work. Uh, Alan Pedersen was my uh, postdoctoral advisor at the University. Um, Kevin Tice is my current collaborator at Michigan State. And then uh, Dustin, Nikki, and Jonathan. So you know, I met Jonathan yesterday. We're all in. So I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's time. Thank you. The bathroom. Yeah. So do the different varieties of jungles smell differently? You're excited and you're oriented and you're... They don't smell different to me. They're not different to each other. We haven't compared the different subspecies yet. I have the samples. We haven't done the chemistry yet. And can you inoculate a jungle to smell better? One male and one female? It's a great question. Uh, as soon as we understand the bacterial components of this odor, it might be something we can do in the future. You mentioned uh, these being related to maybe hormones in some way. I was just wondering if the stress that they might be under during the sampling process, mm -hmm. to what does that play a role? And is that something you consider? It's a good question. Um, we know from, so the chemistry lab is actually a hormone lab. She's done a lot of work on hormones. And we know it actually takes a little while for stress hormones to increase when you're handling them. And she's done a lot of studies on corticosterone as well. Uh, it's usually about a 30 minute period, and we tend to take these samples in the first five minutes of handling them. So for the wild birds, I wouldn't expect that uh, that stress would have an effect. Um, I have done one study that didn't turn out the way I thought it would, and captive birds, and I do think stress might roll. Well. Um, but actually, at least in the case of this study and several other studies with these birds, these are birds that we captured at the, their sites when they were um, newly independent juveniles. They were raised in captivity at Indiana University in identical conditions. It's called a common garden experiment. And so not only did we look at odor, but we looked at the hormone levels and behavior changes. And these were persistent no matter what the environment was. So, um, Forgive me if I mix up your data, but so the within perion versus the extra perion smelled the same, but you detected no difference. I didn't measure their odor, but I measured their bacterial communities. Okay. There's no difference in the bacteria. So if the female is choosing her extra perion based on his smell, wouldn't she, wouldn't she want her young to smell like the extra perion instead of becoming the smell of her social mate, which is less ideal? 
It's a good question. Um, I hadn't thought of it in that direction. I'd actually thought of it in a different direction, which is that uh, we've, we've, we've looked and looked and never seen any difference in parental care based on whether the offspring were related or unrelated. And to me, this says, well, this is one mechanism to ensure care for by the father because he doesn't know what's happening. Right, but but for her child, children to make success, right. you want them. She want them to smell better. Possibly, yeah. That's a that's a good question. Can I take one more question? Um, some of the birds have uh, a mating ritual. I don't know if that's supposed to do it. But did you take that into account when you're studying? I did. Um, so juncos don't have a particularly elaborate mating ritual, uh, but they do court females, and I didn't choose to show it, but I do have a video. Um, they, they will sing a particular type of song, they will spread their tail feathers, they will spread their wings. And I started noticing that they're all actually wiping their bills on whatever branch they're on, and other people started noticing it. And I did a whole study trying to understand what that was, and I actually just uh, published a paper uh, called the Olfactory Display Hypothesis, because I think what could be happening is they have dried cream oil on their bill, but it's waxy. And by rubbing it on the branch, they're warming it up a bit and releasing it. So I suspect there might actually be an olfactory component to their display. A lot of work still to be done, but it's an exciting thing. Thanks again. Thank you.